art, a form of self-expression, of passion, love, sadness, emotion. Art used to be for those with an incredibly high IQ, but no longer. I go to art galleries nowadays and it makes me feel sick. I used to look at art and think, wow, how have they done that? Now it's more, what? How is that in here? I, I could do that. That's terrible. I mean, I mean, it's just a blank canvas. Honestly, the state of art these days. What do you mean stop shouting? What do you mean I'm being kicked out of the art gallery? The time has come for a new great artist to arrive. Someone who can follow in the footsteps of Vincent van Gogh, tread in the boot holes of Claude Monet, and match the nimble fingerwork of Leonardo da Vinci. But how can I create such a specimen? The answer is simple. Sims 4. I will harness the scientific power of Sims 4, allowing me to sculpt the perfect artist. If you're all sitting comfortably then, let's begin. The first course of action was character creation. If we were going to create the perfect artist, they had to look the part. I began with the face. He needed to be strapping and handsome, so I started by giving him a strong jawline. Next, I made his eyes unbelievably wide to make sure he can take in as much information as possible, allowing him to reproduce it back onto the canvas. With the further addition of a moustache and beret, he was nearly ready. All that was left to do was give him a name something that will make him instantly recognisable. Yes, I've got it. Introducing Schmablo Picasso. This means he can just sign all of his artwork Picasso and people will think it's the real guy. Now that we had our artist, it was time to give him a studio. I arrived at a new plot of land with big dreams. It was a small house in a nice peaceful suburb near a river, so that if Schmablo ever needs a place to relax, he can go outside and feel at one with nature by doing a spot of fishing. And while Schmablo was fishing, I took to giving the house a couple of refurbishments. Just, uh, just give me a couple of seconds here. Just, um, just, uh, okay, we are ready to go. This house had to be the ultimate studio. Therefore, I sold everything and replaced it all with an easel. The back wall is going to become our own personal gallery. Therefore, I placed chairs in a circle as sort of a viewing area, and after making all of the walls and floors white, Schmablo could finally move in. Welcome everyone to the Tate Modern. It was time to put Schmablo to work. This would be his first ever painting. I can only imagine what wonders Schmablo will come up with. They say an artist's first painting says a lot about them as a person, in which case Schmablo must be a... Uh, horse? It seems this first piece took a lot out of Schmablo, as after finishing his painting, he immediately went to relieve himself. In the meantime, this mysterious painting needed a name. The key to naming artwork is to give a very vague title that sounds a lot deeper than it actually is. I called this one Stallion, a man's best friend. Wow, the first one, eh? This is the start of something great. I feel like Schmablo needs someone to share this moment with, someone to gaze upon his work. Hmm. Oh, who's this? Bella Goth. Perfect. Unfortunately, at this point, Schmablo had become slightly distracted with making some breakfast. I'm pretty sure you want me to use the spatula like it's a pickaxe, Schmablo. Anyway, never mind that. Get out there and say hello to this new person. Oh, for God's sake, he's taking his breakfast with him. What? Schmablo, you've, you've gone straight past her. She's just there. Oh, thank God, she's walking this way anyway. And whoa, whoa, what a beauty. What, what an absolute catch. What a fine lady you've managed to find there, Schmablo. Early interactions between Schmablo and Bella seemed to be going well. They had a real chemistry between them, and it was clear to me that Bella was the perfect person to act as Schmablo's confidant. Every artist needs an accomplice, someone who can draw inspiration from them at all times. Bella would be the Samwise to our Frodo, the Ron Weasley to our Harry- B Oh, she's gone. Ah oh, well, I, I guess let's just do another painting. Schmablo once again got to work. I wonder what he could be painting this time. It's just so exciting. What is that, a, a vegetable of some sort maybe? Oh, N no, he seems to have drawn the game Spore. That's brilliant. Maybe the reason he's depicted an alien here is to symbolise how he feels alienated by Bella Goth. Or maybe coming into contact with a woman makes him feel like an alien. In many ways, women are just like aliens. His social disconnect makes him feel like he's from another planet. Oh boy, that is some deep stuff, Schmablo. Quick, let's do another. After that deep and meaningful painting, I wonder what this next one will mean. Maybe it'll represent how Schmablo feels about politics. Or maybe it'll show how he feels about the environment. Or maybe it'll show how he feels about... Uh... Melons? 
Maybe he's hungry? Schmablo's next piece depicted a raging storm, which makes me think he wasn't too happy about my comments on his melon picture. You can't blame him really, it had been a long day, and he needed a good rest. The next morning, after waddling over to the toilet, Schmablo was just about to make breakfast, but oh, hang on. Bella Goth is back. This is our chance to get her in on our scheme to redefine the art world. Unfortunately, Schmablo was so caught off guard by her sudden arrival that he seemed to lose all social ability. Luckily, in Schmablo's case, he lets the paint do the talking. And after crafting yet another successful piece, this one named Will Smith's House, Bella was incredibly impressed, and the two began to reignite the chemistry they had the previous day. Bella was taken by Schmablo's ambition, and was more than happy to agree to being his agent. She then left to go sort out some important business deals. Anyway, now we have someone who's willing to spread the word about us, it's time to get painting again. All of Schmablo's pieces so far had been rather impressionist, so I thought I would really test his ability, and ask him to try realism. Unfortunately, in this game you can only paint realism based on things in your immediate surroundings, and I decorated all of the walls and floors plain white. I, I guess we could try painting, uh, the oven? Mwah, schmablo, it's beautiful. I shall call it my oven. Seeing as realism was such a success, I thought maybe I'd push Schmablo's range the opposite way and try a bit of pop art. This culminated in a very interesting piece of work which I named The Duality of Man, even though one of them is a woman. <sighs> Yet again, Schmablo had put in a good shift, and he went to bed that night feeling very satisfied. The next morning, after abusing some more French toast, Schmablo again wandered over to the canvas, but just as he was about to pick up his brushes, he received a text message from Bella Goth, saying that she wanted to come over, and when she arrived, she was in a flirty mood. This was the perfect opportunity to make a move in a romantic direction, which immediately backfired and then everyone just felt really awkward and embarrassed. Luckily, as I've said before, Schmablo lets his painting do the talking, and he proceeded to paint what seems to be a, a large fried egg. This made things a lot more relaxed again, so much so that Schmablo and Bella had a whole conversation in the bathroom. This conversation may have gone on a little long though, because Bella eventually decided to leave. Probably for the best, as we could now get on with some more painting. Schmablo's second piece depicted a man trapped by a large carnivorous plant, possibly symbolising how Schmablo felt when he was trapped in the bathroom with Bella. He then had a short practice at painting melons again, and by this point had ranked up to level 5 painting. Not only did this signify a meteoric rise in Schmablo's skill, but it gave him newfound aspirations. Musical aspirations. Schmablo wanted to learn an instrument, and what better way for an artist to spend his free time than tinkling the ivories of a grand piano? This was perfect. Not only would we rake in the cash from our artwork, but we could compose an album on the side. Okay, Schmablo, I'm expecting big things. Let's hear it. That was categorically the worst thing I've ever heard. I think maybe for now we just stick to the painting. And oh great, look, Bella's come over again. I have a plan for today. This time, Schmablo is sure to win Bella's heart. Why, you ask? Because today, he will be painting her. Okay now, Bella, if you just turn this way, um, this way please, just, just turn this way. P please, <laughs> just turn around. Oh, for God's sake, that'll do. Schmablo got to work. Everything was riding on this being perfect. His whole relationship was on the line. And let me tell you, it was perfect. A true masterpiece. This painting makes the Mona Lisa look like an overpriced postcard. It was beautiful, and Bella was over the moon. To make it even more romantic, I had Schmablo make a copy so that whenever he looks up at his gallery wall, he remembers her beautiful face. And also so he can eventually cash it in for millions of pounds. Thankfully Bella didn't hear this as she went home to put up her new gift, giving us the time to get in a few more paintings. The first of which was a couple of giraffes, which I called David Attenborough's Family. A painting so moving that I thought it deserved its own song. It's up to you Schmablo, let's hear this beautiful song. Oh. Oh god. Oh no. I don't think I can take much more of this. Oh good, Bella's calling. Quick, someone stop him! Bella came over once more and they chatted the night away. Schmablo went to bed dreaming sweet dreams of her, hoping tomorrow he could try painting her from memory. Morning came and he tried just that. Um, um, Schmablo, uh, 
Are you sure? Are you sure that's Bella? It, lo it looks a bit more like Garfield to me. Schmablo's next few paintings followed a similar theme. The house that him and Bella would live in together. The lighthouse that him and Bella would uh, live in together. The... Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. What is that? It looks like a rabbit running away from a castle. Or maybe uh, Marshmallow Man visits Tower Bridge. Thankfully, this chain of paintings was put to an end by another visit from Bella. And wow, they are so perfect together. Look at them, what a happy couple. Wait, Schmablo, where are you going? To work? Wait, Schmablo has a job? It turns out Schmablo had found himself a job as a stand-up comedian. Unfortunately for him though, he seemed to be having problems. A local animal shelter has invited Schmablo to MC their fundraiser, but he forgot to prepare. Should he mine the internet for animal jokes, or wing it and hope for the best? I reckon he can wing this one. Oh, oh. Oh dear. Having failed at his stand-up gig, he returned home looking downtrodden. What? Schmabler, what are you do- Oh, that, that is disgusting. You're just dancing around in bin juice. Have a shower, you dirty man. Disgusting. G go to bed. Regretting his actions from last night, Schmablo woke up and immediately painted three paintings to make up for his episode with the trash pile. And by the time he was finished, Bella was once again asking to come over. But something was different this time. Schmablo was feeling confident, and without any instruction, he went straight in for a hug. I knew at this moment I had to capitalise on this confidence, and immediately after blew a kiss her way, as well as flexing Schmablo's huge muscles. Then it was time. Schmablo went in for the big one. Wow, I'm, I'm so proud. They grow up so fast. But what should have been the most amazing moment of Schmablo's life was agonizingly cut short, as he realized he was late for work. How cruel that his job in stand-up comedy should come between him and the woman he loves. He went to bed that night thinking about what could have been. The next morning, Schmablo's paintings reflected his dark mood. For example, this sinister-looking big red X, which I chose to name pain and suffering and pain. His following painting depicted a woman in black. Maybe this is a representation of Bella Goth, the woman that got away. Or perhaps he's a really big fan of Daniel Radcliffe. This painting session had proved rather cathartic for Schmablo. He'd exercised the demons of the previous night, straight out onto the canvas, and he felt much better for it. This gave him an idea. Maybe inviting Bella round for a painting session would cheer her up as well. I mean, who wouldn't feel better after looking at this magnificent wall of art. But upon Bella's arrival, she seemed different somehow. Schmablo tried to cheer her up a bit by talking to her about the interesting day he'd had so far, which worked a bit, but there was something on Bella's mind, something that he just couldn't figure out. Maybe there was some food on his face, or maybe she was thinking about his incredible artwork. No, it's something different. I just wish there was an easy way to tell, something that clearly indicated what was on her mind. <gasps> Squids. Schmablo knew just what to do. He was going to cook Bella a nice bit of calamari. But first, he'd need to catch a squid. Luckily, he'd been practicing his fishing skills just for an occasion such as this one. He ran outside with a spring in his step, eager to impress his one true love with a rare catch. Within moments, he had something on the end of his rod. Unfortunately, it was just a sea bass. He tried again, but this time reeled in a salmon, and by now, a couple of hours had passed since he first went outside. A sea bass and a salmon would have to do. I mean, they all come from the water anyway, so I don't really see the difference. Schmablo strolled back to his house, excited to see the look on Bella's face when she saw what he had caught for her. Bella? Oh, Bella, I'm home. W wait. <gasps> no, it can't be. Bella has stolen all of the paintings. Why? Bella, how could you? Schmablo was heartbroken. All of his hard work had been ruined, and by none other than his future wife. He sat down at the piano and played a somber piece. No, Schmablo, this isn't the end. Bella, if that even is her real name, thinks she'll never be caught. That the police will never be able to identify her. But there's one thing she didn't account for. And that's that her victim would have a painting of her on his wall. Uh, oh, she stole that as well. Damn it. In that case, I guess we'll just have to hunt her down ourselves. Your artwork is out there somewhere. All you have to do is get it back. Schmablo knew what needed to be done. First, however, he needed some training.
After training for literally minutes of time, Schmablo was finally ready. All he had to do now was find Bella. Oh, but she could be miles away by now. Who knows where- oh, there she is. Th this is for my paintings, and, and and this is this that that one's for art, and th and this one's for the Tate Modern. An all-out brawl commenced. Unfortunately, this drew a bit of a crowd, and in the fray, Bella managed to escape. Schmablo chased after her, but as he ran, his phone started ringing, and he realised he was once again late for work. It was all over. He picked up the phone, expecting bad news. However, he was amazed to find out he was being promoted. Not only that, but the people at his work were so moved by his emotional piano playing, they wanted to offer him a place as a professional musician. Well, uh, painting is overrated anyway, Schmablo. This could be your lucky break. Looks like all's well that ends well. Tell you what, how about one last tune to play us out? Schmablo, take it away. Now an esteemed musician, Schmablo has decided to put everything on the line. Even faking his own death, spreading rumours that he was killed by an overexposure to dubstep, all for the chance to reclaim the paintings that are rightfully his. His next step will put him into a world of jeopardy. But, to achieve his goal, he must bring the system down from the inside. Schmablo was going to join a criminal gang. Name, Robbie Rotten, seasoned criminal of the Lazy Town circuit. Arrested 86 times on counts of battery, arson, kidnapping, vibing too hard, and much more. Captured every single time by a strange man in a blimp called Sporticus, Robbie is out to get revenge. Not just on Sporticus, but on the whole world. Name, Fagan. Cunning like a weasel, he uses a network of poor orphan boys to do his dirty work. Having branched off from the cast of the musical Oliver to pursue a career in villainy, his sneaky antics and brilliant tactics will always keep the gang one step ahead. Name: Dick Dastardly Previously a race car driver in the Wacky Racers Grand Prix, Dick decided to retire from motorsport and went to work in IT. Now, with a wealth of computer experience under his belt, there isn't a program in the world he can't hack into. Google Chrome, Microsoft Paint, CoolMathsGames.com, you name it, he can hack it. Together, this trio form the infamous gang known as Triple Trifle, but their name will now hold a more ironic tone, as they've just accepted a fourth member into their ranks. And they can't wait to teach Schmablo Picasso the ropes. It was a fine day in the peaceful neighbourhood of Willow Creek and Schmablo had received special intel that this was to be the place of his gang's new headquarters. He turned up on site and was greeted warmly by his new co-workers. Immediately, they all began to bond by fantasizing about the various things they wanted to steal. In an attempt to win favor with the group, Schmablo told everyone that he would like to steal a car. Of course, in reality, he wouldn't steal a car, and on the same vein, he certainly wouldn't pirate a movie. The boys were convinced though, and they all took the opportunity to move in. From the get-go, it was clear that these three were high-level criminals, and Dick Dastardly began to show off his skills by hacking famous people's Twitter accounts without even looking at the computer screen. Fagan then picked up the iPad and began downloading apps with free trials and then cancelling the subscription to get 7 days for free. As Schmablo didn't have any villainous skills to show off yet, he thought he would instead gain his gang's trust by cooking them up a batch of his famous French toast. Schmablo was rather good at cooking, and one day, he might even host his own cooking show. After eating their meal, the gang decided it was time for their first ever criminal outing. And so, they crept out onto the street and began to wreak some havoc. It wasn't long before they found their first unsuspecting victim. Dick Dastardly took it upon himself to do a bit of tomfoolery. But, whilst he did so, something rather peculiar happened. A visitor had arrived at the door of their secret lair. The Triple Trifle Gang didn't have time to be bothering with visitors. They had bad deeds to be getting up to, and Schmablo and the crew walked straight past the visitor without even a wave. But then, Schmablo stopped in his tracks. She was quite possibly the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. 
Always the romantic, Shmablo couldn't resist introducing himself to his new crush, Megumi. And, before long, they were getting on like a house on fire. But eventually, thoughts of Bella Goth began to sneak back into Shmablo's mind, and he became embarrassed. So he left to go and splash around in the pond. Whilst he was doing so, Megumi invited herself inside, and for some reason, began searching through the files on the gang's computer. Oh well, it was probably nothing. And, after clearing up the mess he'd made outside, Shmablo decided to try again. This time, Megumi and Shmablo got on even better, and soon they were good friends. They chatted the rest of the day away, and eventually, Megumi went home. And this meant it was finally time to get down to some real business. As they searched on Google Maps, the gang held a meeting to try and decide where to stage their very first heist. And, of all the places in the neighbourhood, they settled on the library. This was perfect! If they were going to learn how to steal, then what better way to do so than steal books that would teach them how to steal? That night, the gang arrived at the library under the cover of darkness, and they immediately split up so as not to draw too much attention. Shmablo entered, grabbed a book off the shelf, and began to read 101 Ways to Steal an Old Woman's Purse by Michael Morpurgo. Blimey, he's branched out from children's fiction, thought Shmablo. Meanwhile, Fagan was on the prowl, and with his superb stealth, he was able to steal a desk lamp without anyone noticing. With a great rush of adrenaline, the gang escaped from the library as quickly as possible and rendezvoused at some nearby picnic benches. Giddy with excitement, and reveling in their victory after a hard day's being bad guys, they all headed home and went to sleep. The next morning, spirits were high, and the guys were all still feeling triumphant about their first steal. A lamp! A whole lamp! they said to each other. How can we ever top this? Hmm, it was a difficult question. What could be a bigger heist than stealing a whole desk lamp? If they were going to go even bigger, they would need more equipment. And, because of this, two new state-of-the-art hacking stations were installed into the secret lair. These new computers allowed them to get up to even more mischief. And it was Schmablo this time who kicked things off, by copying out everything he'd read last night, and publishing it in a new book under his own name. A classic bit of copyright infringement. Take that, Michael Morpurgo! But then he realised, if he wanted people to still believe he was dead, it was probably best if he didn't use his real name, as publishing a book from beyond the grave wasn't very common. There we go, much better. While Shmablo was doing this, Robbie Rotten had somehow managed to set himself on fire, and it was all a bit too much chaos for Dick Dastardly, who went outside and kicked the bin over to take out his frustration. He then picked it back up again, because even amongst villains, littering isn't cool. Once the commotion had died down, the phone rang, and Megumi was calling to see if she could come over. Shmablo was delighted by this, another chance to flirt with the woman of his dreams. But, as they talked, it turned out Megumi was more intelligent than he ever believed. In fact, she too wanted to be a member of a criminal gang, and if they let her join, she promised to help them steal even bigger items than lamps. With Megumi's help, after a long discussion, they settled on a new plan. Shmablo had informed the group that he was aware of the disappearance of some priceless paintings. Of course, these were his paintings, but the rest of them didn't need to know that. Together, they identified three potential locations that these paintings could have been sold to. Number one was the Movers and Shakers gym, number two was the Blue Velvet nightclub, and number three, probably the most likely of all, was the Municipal Museum. To cover all bases, they would do three different heists on three different nights. And, by the end of this mission, the paintings would hopefully be in Schmablo's hands again. The scheme was laid out, darkness had fallen, and the gang headed to their first location, the Movers and Shakers gym. The library had been one thing, but in such a public place as this, Schmablo couldn't risk being recognised. And so, as the others went in, he devised a plan that in the event of an emergency, he would change into a clever disguise. Initially though, it was important to act natural. So, Megumi hit the weights, Dick Dastardly went for a run on the treadmill, and the rest of them went over towards the punching bags. Fagan took a short break from dancing to scope out the upstairs. 
but apart from some fruit bowls, there didn't appear to be much to steal. The gym was turning out to be disappointingly ordinary. But then, the worst possible thing happened. Bella Goff walked in. In a panic, Schmablu changed his disguise straight away. He could overhear Bella from the other side of the building. She was asking around about the location of a famous painter. Schmablu attempted to reach the others to tell them they had to leave now, but he could not find the right moment to sneak past. With great intuition, Megumi sensed what was going on, and stepped in to help by engaging Bella in casual conversation. She kept it up for quite some time, and after Bella had finally left, she relayed the whole thing to Schmablo. Apparently, Megumi had managed to get herself and four friends invites to Bella Goff's house. Schmablo couldn't believe it. It was a daunting prospect, but his paintings could very well be in that house, and he might now have the perfect opportunity to steal them back right from under Bella's nose. Tomorrow's heist on the nightclub would have to be postponed, and the next day, all anyone could think about was how on earth they were going to raid the Goff residence. Dick dastardly tried remote controlling a drone around the neighbourhood to get a view of the house from the air. Of course, he wasn't looking at the screen while doing this, so the drone crashed into a tree before he could get any footage. Thankfully, Megumi came by later that day with some better information. Rumour had it that Bella's room was situated at the very top of the house, and this was most likely where Schmablo's paintings could be hidden. If Fagan, Dick and Robbie could keep the Goff family distracted downstairs, then Schmablo could creep upstairs by himself in his disguise and take back his art for good. Around 10pm that night, they turned up on the premises and Schmablo wasted no time. He made a beeline straight for the stairs. One flight, and then another. But as he reached the top floor, he was shocked to find that Bella hadn't gone down to greet the other guests. She was still here. And, for the first time since that fateful day, when she had broken his heart all those years ago, Schmablo and Bella were now face to face. This was the absolute worst case scenario. Not only was Schmablo just a few meters away from his arch nemesis, but as he looked around Bella's room, his artwork was nowhere to be seen. He was beginning to panic, but he had to try and act natural. Bella didn't seem to have recognized him, thanks to his unbelievably convincing disguise. Schmablo introduced himself to her as Pablo. Haha, <laughs> she'll never see through that one. And, trying to keep up the act, he began to make polite conversation, all the while searching for a way to excuse himself from the room. Of course, it didn't help his case that he had just agreed to a game of chess. Schmablo asked Bella about what she did for work. Bella told him she ran several businesses within the neighborhood, such as a nightclub and a museum. This was intriguing, and Schmablo wanted to ask more. But before he could, Robbie Rotten attempted to steal a houseplant downstairs, and Bella sensed that something was wrong. Seeing an opening, Schmablo made a break for it, but Bella was following him downstairs. Schmablo quickened his stride and went to hide in the kitchen. Meanwhile, Robbie Rotten was trying to play the whole thing off by pretending to be asleep. Once the commotion died down, however, he crept upstairs by himself and began to loot all of Bella's possessions. He then went down to the bathroom and tried to steal the bath plugs, but Bella caught him in the act and asked him to stop. Dick Dastardly had made his way outside, and he sent the gang a warning signal using his iPad. But Schmablo wasn't paying attention. He got greedy and tried to steal a lampshade. At which point, Bella's husband Mortimer appeared out of nowhere, and the gang were escorted off the premises and told to go away and never come back. When they got home, they were all feeling a little bit disappointed. No paintings, no successful steals, and that was weird, where had Megumi gone? But just as all seemed lost, Schmablo remembered what Bella had said about the nightclub and the museum. This was concrete proof that their plan had been on the right track. All they had to do now is what they were going to do in the first place. A couple of cheeky heists, and Schmablo was sure that his paintings would turn up. The next day, the gang readied themselves to ransack the nightclub. Robbie Rotten tested out his new electric taser technique by pranking Schmablo, but it didn't go very well. Schmablo tried to get back at him by using his new air horn technique. 
But that went just as poorly. Eventually, Megumi was calling, as she wanted to apologise for disappearing last night. This reunion got Schmablo so overcome with joy, that upon seeing her, he gave her a big fat kiss. What's more, it seemed to go down pretty well, and Schmablo could feel some chemistry building between the two of them. That is, until Megumi left to go and sift through the gang's computer. She was probably just checking over the details of tonight's heist. And she was right to do so, because the night was approaching fast, and the crucial time was at hand. They arrived at the nightclub at 9.25 on the dot just as planned. Schmablo changed into his disguise and headed in. Immediately, he was drawn to a large piano in the middle of the room. He walked over and began to play some of his greatest hits. He was so good, in fact, that a crowd began to gather around him. And, with all the attention on Smablo, Fagan was able to drift upstairs, and he noticed a bunch of artwork lining the walls. He didn't know whether this was the artwork that Schmablo had been talking about, but he decided to steal some anyway. Back downstairs, the crowd around Schmablo was getting really rather big. So big, in fact, that he hadn't noticed that Bella Goff was sitting only a few meters away. Cunning as ever, and sensing an opportunity, Fagan snuck back downstairs and made a move. He sat down with Bella Goff and asked her if she knew the artist of the paintings he had just stolen. Bella didn't know, which meant that this was not Schmablo's work. Upon further inspection, Schmablo was appalled that Fagan had ever mistook this rubbish for his. He painted fine pieces like Marshmallow Man Runs Away From Tower Bridge and Will Smith's House. So the raid on the nightclub was not a success. And after Fagan caused a distraction using the gang's new air horn technique, they pieced the scene and went home to bed empty-handed. Although the gang were upset about this, the bright side was they were now 100% certain that the paintings they were looking for were in the Municipal Museum. And for Schmablo in particular, the good news did not end there, as his phone started to ring and Megumi called to invite him on a date. Schmablo couldn't believe it. A date with the woman of his dreams. Oh man, oh boy, oh man, he must have been the happiest guy alive. They headed into a bar together, and Schmablo ordered them a round of dim and gusty, which was really, uh, tasty. With a drink inside him, Schmablo began to try out his flirting game. He was using all of the classics, like, So, I heard you're a fan of raisins, but how do you feel about a date? Which was a pointless question, as they were already on a date. With the smooth talking out of the way, Schmablo plucked up the courage to ask the big question. Was Megumi single? No. She was... Married? It couldn't be! Schmablo's heart was broken. But Schmablo was a man of moral fibre. And even after hearing this devastating news, he made sure to sit a respectful distance away from Megumi for the rest of the date. No, it turned out that the reason Megumi had invited him here was so that she could discuss tonight's heist on the museum with him one-to-one. -one. She revealed to him that she was actually an undercover cop, investigating the surroundings of Schmablo's own mysterious death. Megumi told Schmablo that she would stop at nothing to help reunite him with his art, and she assured him that Bella Goff wouldn't know a thing that he would walk away a free man, and that the rest of the Triple Trifle Gang would be thrown in prison where they belong. Schmablo headed back home not quite knowing how to feel. Of course, he was gutted that Megumi had a husband, but a more pressing matter now filled his mind. Could he really sell out the Triple Trifle Gang? After all, they'd been through so much together, he'd sort of grown to like these guys. Fagan and his funny hat, Dick and his hacking skills, Robbie and his silly walk. He kind of considered them his friends. What was he to do? The day rolled on, and the crew changed into their super serious heist disguises. Megumi came over once more, and Schmablo apologised to her for making romantic advances, even though she was married and pregnant apparently. She was pregnant the whole time as well, oh my god. But Schmablo didn't have time for any more revelations. He went into the bathroom and tried to hype himself up. Okay, he was gonna do this, no matter the cost. 
He set out on this journey for one reason and one reason only. And just because he'd accidentally fallen for a pregnant woman and become friends with a load of cartoon villains, that wasn't gonna change. He was going to get his artwork back. That evening, as the sun was setting, they arrived at the museum. Everyone headed around the side, and Megumi started to give them all a pre-heist briefing. Schmabla was itching to get inside. Megumi gave a nod in his direction, and he saw this as his cue to go. But, as it turned out, Megumi wasn't nodding at him at all. She was nodding to someone behind him. And then, the unthinkable happened. It was all a setup. Megumi wasn't an undercover cop at all. She was an undercover friend of Bella Goth, posing as an undercover cop, posing as a gang member. Megumi began to explain that Bella had realized that what she did was wrong, and how she never should have stolen Schmablo's paintings, and that she had lost all of them in a game of poker anyway, and that the Mount Komarebi Mafia now had them and were putting them up as the grand prize of the Mount Komarebi skiing competition. What? Schmablo didn't believe a single word of it. Without hesitation, he hit Bella Goff with the air horn technique and made his escape. He ran inside the museum and across the hall to where his artwork probably was, at which point he found he really needed the toilet. But then he came back and he began searching everywhere for his paintings. Was this his artwork? Um, oh gosh, he couldn't remember. He stole it anyway just to make sure. Okay, what about this one? Was this his artwork? No, this one was too French Impressionist. And how about this one? Was this his artwork? No, this wasn't either. It was far too postmodern. He saw Bella and Megumi leaving outside, and it finally dawned on him. Maybe they weren't lying. Maybe his artwork wasn't in this museum. And if that was the case, he now knew exactly where he had to go. No! Don't leave, Schmablo! cried the Triple Trifle Gang from behind him. But Schmablo kept walking. He walked all the way home and began to paint. It would be his first painting since all those years ago, and he would leave it here as a parting gift to Triple Trifle, so they always knew just where to find him. He named it Mount Komarebi. It was time for Schmablo to learn how to ski. Skiing, snowboarding, toboggan, getting trapped in an avalanche. Winter sports can be so much fun. That is, unless you are a character on my computer in Sims 4. My Sim, Schmablo Picasso, was currently in a bit of an awkward situation. Having once been a world-famous artist, Schmablo's dreams were shattered when all of his paintings were stolen by his then-girlfriend, Bella Goth. As it so happened, Bella was part of an organization known as the Mount Komarebi Mafia, a discovery Schmablo made upon joining his own criminal gang with the help of local troublemakers Robbie Rotten, Fagan, and Dick Dastardly. In a weird twist of fate, however, this Mafia also owned majority stakes in the Sims 4 Winter Olympics. The grand prize for this prestigious competition? You guessed it, Schmablo's paintings. So here he was, freezing his left testicle off outside the chalets of Mount Komarebi, wondering how on earth he was ever going to win a skiing and snowboarding competition, having never done either activity in his life. Especially when the opposition this year was incredibly tough. There was Crash Helmet Kevin. Having accidentally frozen the top of his head whilst bending down to get a pizza out of his freezer, Kevin's skull was so hard he could survive the most dangerous of falls, simply by landing on his dome. Then there was Sharon Snowshoe. Part throb of the snowboarding scene, Sharon was admired the world over for her giant ears, which are not only very cool and very sexy, but give her impeccable balance on her trusty snowboard. Furthermore, she hails from a rich dynasty of snowshoe makers. If one thing's for sure, her boots will be staying firmly on her feet. And finally, there was Mrs. Frosty, an expert freestyle snowboarder whose identity remains a mystery. That mascot costume never comes off, and rumor has it whoever is under the suit has invented special methods to ensure they haven't yet once been to the toilet. Phew, Schmablo really didn't stand much of a chance, but he was gonna get his paintings back if it cost him an arm and a leg, and probably a couple of broken bones as well. So, he put on his tuxedo, which was the closest thing he owned to a ski jacket, and turned up at the competition HQ.
he would be staying with the other competitors in a luxury modern Japanese tatami apartment. The location was much more peaceful than Shmablo had expected, and he engaged himself in a spot of pre-tournament topiary, whilst chatting away with Mrs. Frosty, but oh, hang on. Why is she here? Bella Goff had walked into the room. Shmablo's topiary immediately rotted. Although he wasn't best pleased to see the woman who had stolen his most prized possessions, Bella did at least arrive with good intentions. She claimed to have left behind her criminal ways, and was instead here to offer Shmablo some insider advice. It dawned on Shmablo that having never stepped foot in one singular ski, he was probably going to need all the advice he could get. So reluctantly, he accepted, and Bella informed him of the situation. The competition was to be hosted at Mount Komarebi Ski Resort, and overseen by a mysterious gentleman known as the Judge. The Judge was a member of the Mafia Bella was once a part of, and this is who Shmablo would have to impress. It was difficult to tell whether the judge's face was deliberately void of expression, or whether he was just so cold it had frozen into place. But before Shmablo could decide, the first round of the Sims 4 Winter Olympics was about to begin. They would start at the very bottom of the resort, on what was known as the Baby Slope. Hmm, this was a bit embarrassing, but for Shmablo it might be a lucky break, as it would give him the opportunity to learn the basics. He made his way to the top of the run, clipped into his skis, and feeling confident he could handle a slope made for babies, he went for it. Oh god, whoa Nelly, this was way harder than he anticipated. Shmablo felt like Bambi from that movie, Bambi. And when he reached the bottom, instead of coming to a graceful halt, he fell flat on his ass. The judge was not impressed. Sharon Snowshoe wandered across full of smugness. She suggested skiing better, then telling him to watch this, which, even if she was trying to be helpful, would do Shmablo no good, as Sharon was a snowboarder. She headed to the top of the baby slope, and then proceeded to slalom down it in style, swaying side to side until she too ended up on her rear end. Ha ha, thought Shmablo, these twerps were just as bad as him, perhaps he had a chance. Crash Helmet Kevin was next, and after warming up by doing a couple of press-ups, he showed them all just how it was done, gliding down the hill with ease and shifting his skis expertly for a controlled finish. He was certainly the current favourite, or he would have been had everyone not been distracted by Bella Goff, who had lost control of her sledge and went crashing over several huge jumps, impressing the judge so much that he forgot she wasn't even competing. And this gave Mrs. Frosty an idea. The mysterious mascot took her snowboard and began to ride down the sledge run, shooting up the first ramp and pulling off an exciting bunny hop. At the end of the first round, the only certain thing was Shmablo was dead last. His tuxedo was filthy, and he went to bed battered and bruised, wondering how he would even conceive of making a comeback. The next morning didn't start much better, as the contestants were woken up early by the sound of the judge kicking the bin over. I guess in the Mafia this is what they call an alarm clock. The baby slope might have been hard, but today's challenge would be even more difficult, as each competitor was forced to take on the blue run. Full of self-importance, despite her poor form yesterday, Sharon Snowshoe was first to ride the cable car to the mountain's peak, and this time she was determined to show just why they called her Dumbo. Hurtling down the hill at breakneck pace, as she went soaring over each jump, you'd be forgiven for thinking she could fly. With those big ears rippling in the wind, it was a very impressive run. As a matter of pride, Crash Helmet Kevin couldn't let anyone be seen to be faster than him. So, he took to the stage next, hoisting on his skis and launching onto the piste with reckless abandon. In fact, Kevin's head was so round and had so little friction that he may have overcooked it and his jumps nearly sent him out of control. Blimey, these two would be very tough acts to follow. And of course, Shmablo was next. As he reached the top, his knees were trembling. Okay, Shmablo, just take this run as carefully as possible. He didn't need to do fancy jumps. If he could just make it to the bottom in a dignified way, that would be enough. Unfortunately, Shmablo didn't know how to turn properly yet, and uh-oh, the jumps were dead ahead. Oh, God! Crunch! His knees buckled as he hit the floor, but he didn't fall. The second jump came, and Shmablo turned his feet inwards to form a triangle. As an artist, Shmablo knew that triangles were the strongest shape, and he came to a graceful, if not angular, stop at the bottom of the hill. 
He turned around, hoping to see a look of admiration on the judge's face. But the judge was currently distracted by a bunch of large monkey statues he had found. And by the time he returned, Mrs. Frosty was stunting all over the blue run, even managing to film a trick shot montage on the way down. Thankfully, her style wouldn't last, as she decked it at the finish, in such a spectacular fashion in fact, that her trick montage was sent into You've Been Framed and she received a £250 reward in the post. Surely the judge would have to mark her down for that, but hang on, now he was off enjoying a quick sledge. This wasn't fair. Sure, <sighs> Schmablo should have known. This competition was rigged from the very beginning. Classic Mafia business. The idea they would just give him his paintings back if he did a bit of skiing was too good to be true. Perhaps his paintings weren't even up for grabs in the first place. Perhaps Bella Goff was still having him on. Why did he fall for her every single time? Hook, line and sinker, Schmablo felt so gullible. But it might not be Bella he had to worry about most. As, the next day, her husband, Mortimer, paid the contestants a visit. He introduced himself as the chairman of the Winter Sports Committee, but Schmablo knew this was a front. And, after greeting the other guests, he fixed Schmablo with a menacing stare. I hope you're not thinking of backing out now, he said under his breath in a very convincing Mafia accent. My clients are expecting a good show tomorrow. Schmablo gulped. So that's what this was. He had been set up. The Mafia were making an example out of him. Back out now and he'd be in terrible danger, but continue and he would be a laughing stock. Either way, he couldn't win. The last day of the competition rolled round, and each competitor prepared themselves for a grand finale. Today's challenge would be an exciting double whammy, as each of them would take on the infamous red and black runs in quick succession. The judge began a pre-showcase briefing, but just as he did, Mrs. Frosty ran off. Where was she going? What? Hold up, I could have sworn there was two of her there for a moment. Weird. As Mrs. Frosty was absent, it was up to one of the others to kick things off, and Crash Helmet Kevin boldly volunteered. This was a man with a head so solid he feared nothing, and still, even he was a bit nervous as he reached the top of the red run. With that, he began the first of his two descents. The red run was full of many obstacles, but Kevin zoomed past them with his usual burst of speed, then performing a majestic 360, for which he crossed his skis into a big X, sending the crowd into a burst of ooh and R's. Then, it was back at the chairlift for the treacherous Black Run. This was really no place to be skiing, thought Schmablo. It was no more than a series of sheer cliff faces. And yet, despite this, Kevin maneuvered the course with wonderful dexterity. All was near perfect until, on the final straight, he reached terminal velocity, slipped over, and was sent skidding into a tumbling spin. Although, I have to say, he styled it out pretty well. The fact remained, Kevin had messed up, and the door was now open for someone else to steal the show. Sharon Snowshoe felt it was her time to shine. She took the red run in her stride, dropping a backside 360 with an immaculate landing. However, much the same as Kevin, she had built up too much speed, and ended up in a heap at the bottom of the hill. If she wanted to be in with any shout for first then, her black run would have to be extra spectacular. And it was. Sharon risked it all by doing an insane double backflip then making it into a quadruple backflip off the next pile of rocks. Such was her heritage that even with this crazy amount of spinning, her shoes stayed firmly on her feet. Sadly, the rest of her body did not, as she decked it for what felt like the thousandth time. Sharon too was now also pretty much out of the running. Schmablo couldn't believe his luck. Against all the odds, all the attempted corruption and tournament fixing, he might have a chance of winning this thing after all. All he had to do was not fall over. Surely he could manage just two runs that weren't a complete disaster. Well, kind of. The red run started well. Schmablo may have landed his jumps with quite a wide berth, but land them he did, and he made it to the bottom without any problems. All of a sudden, something in Schmablo had awoken. He had cracked skiing, and he was performing at the peak of his powers. On the black run, Schmablo dived into a fantastic front flip then bending his knees low and swerving side to side across the powder. When he reached the finish for the final time, he was sure he had this in the bag. 
but then Mrs. Frosty returned from her absence. And, well, she wiped the floor with everyone. I mean, come on, that's just not fair. I don't even know what to call that. And what the hell is that? Jesus, Mrs. Frosty, there's children watching this. Tone it down. As the big friendly mascot drifted into finish, Schmablo's heart dropped. He knew it was over. His paintings were going to be given to a stupid giant green... Uh, oh, two stupid giant green... Hang on, there was three of them now. No, wait, four. What was going on? And then, in one great unmasking, it all became clear. It was Robbie Rotten, and Fagan, and Dick Dastardly, and Megumi. He was so confused. Bella arrived, feeling triumphant, and explained the whole thing. She and Schmablo's old gang had hatched a plan to win back his paintings at all costs. It just so happened that each of them was a master at one of the four grades of Ski Slope. So, of course, they had to enter. But the question remained, how could they 100% make sure they would claim first prize? Well, they'd enter as a group, each taking shifts, disguising themselves under the ingenious invention of Mrs. Frosty. But as Bella waffled on and waffled on about her incredible plan, Schmablo began to realize he was starting to get really rather cold. He was only wearing a tuxedo after all, and his normal outfit, jeans and a t-shirt, was even worse. He was turning blue. Icicles were growing on his mustache, and before he knew it, he had frozen to death. Oh, crumbs, what a way to go. Still, at least he could haunt his own paintings now. Gordon Ramsay Paul Hollywood, Mary Berry, three of the oldest people on the world, but also three of the greatest chefs of all time. The purpose of food is primarily survival, but that doesn't mean we can't fill our taste buds with a whole smorgasbord of flavour and texture. There's a real art to cooking, one which I myself have never mastered but it's my dream to one day own a 100 Michelin star restaurant, even though currently the highest amount possible is three. To do this, I'll need someone who can stew up the most delicious and mouthwatering meals. But don't worry, because I have a plan. I will start my own cooking show, using the power of the life simulation game, Sims 4. Advertisements for my cooking show, The Frying House, were sent out in the post, and the next day I was expecting chefs from all over the world to turn up. However, I was shocked to find only three applicants had come back. No matter, I would skip the qualification stages, and the quarterfinal, and, and the semi-final, and get straight into the main event. The only thing left to do was introduce our competitors. First up was Schmeg Wallace. Schmeg Wallace is the son of Greg Wallace, the presenter of BBC's MasterChef. Coming from a lineage of esteemed chefs, Schmeg will have a tough time living up to his father's name. But having attended Hogwarts School of Cooking in his younger years, he's certainly the favourite. Next up was Deborah von Taschenrechner, a baker of wedding cakes. Deborah is the heir to the throne of the German province of Baden-Württemberg. Her parents have paid a lot of money for her to win this TV show, so let's see how it pans out for her. Finally, there was Alan Fossil. Alan is the grandson of Dr. Joseph Fossil, who famously invented fossils back in 1847. Alan lives with his family in Middlesbrough, and according to his wife Hildegard, he makes a mean beef stroganoff. Now that I had the competition, all I needed was a judge, and for this, I would call upon an old friend. Once an artistic great, he went on to become a giant of the music industry, dying in a tragic accident involving an overexposure to dubstep, a genre he was synonymous with throughout his career. He's now back from the dead to judge in a field he knows nothing about. Ladies and gentlemen, the ghost of Schmablo Picasso. The first day arrived, and everyone took their time moving into the frying house. At first, each of them seemed to get along well, but in just a moment's time, these three would be mortal enemies. Eventually, a crowd of fans gathered, hoping to get a glimpse of Schmablo, and everyone was forced inside. It was time to start. Here's how the competition would work. Each contestant must take part in a range of challenges, revolving around the most important meals of the day. Schmablo would then adjudge each round, and after all the rounds were complete, an overall winner would be declared. This winner shall go on to be the star of my new restaurant. While participating, they would have access to the frying house's top-of-the-range cooking stations, as well as a newly created presentation area. Without further ado, it was time for the first round. Breakfast. Alan kicked things off, deciding to go for his favourite morning surprise. Crispy fried pork strips with fried duck eggs on freshly seasoned wholemeal loaf, known more commonly as bacon and eggs on toast. 
Although this dish may not be extremely complex, Alan managed to add his own flair by performing moves such as the double magic frying pan, and after finishing up, he presented the dish to Schmablo Picasso with eager anticipation. This was the moment of truth. The first dish to touch Schmablo's haunted lips. Oh dear, Schmablo was not too impressed. On top of this, Alan's cooking had taken so much out of him that he needed to take a power nap before the next round. In the meanwhile, Deborah got underway. For breakfast, Deborah would be frying a side of pork with gourmet free-range chicken eggs on half-wheat sultana bread, more commonly known as bacon and eggs on toast. Deborah's attempt did not go as smoothly, as she managed to drop the pepper shaker into the frying pan. This inadvertently made her meal a lot better, as Schmablo's favourite seasoning is in fact black pepper. Unfortunately, Schmablo isn't fond of toast, as he often describes it as the defamation of bread. Therefore, Schmablo still wasn't happy with the outcome of his meal. Schmablo's final hope of a good breakfast was in the hands of Schmeg Wallace, but his expectations dropped immediately as Schmeg returned home having been rolling around in the garden. To make himself more hygienic for cooking, he jumped in the bath, washing himself thoroughly using some sort of self-imposed waterboarding technique. And once clean, he set about making a party-sized serving of pancakes. Schmeg's knowledge of cooking was immediately clear, as he deduced that pancakes don't actually include any vegetables. Schmeg settled on using eggs and flour instead, and before long he'd whipped up a huge tower of pancakes. Schmablo was delighted with this, the buttery texture, the sweetness of the maple syrup. Schmeg Wallace was crowned the winner of the first round, and he celebrated in style. Moving into the brunch round, Alan Fossil had a point to prove, and he would prove it by making some macaroni cheese. His recipe involved turning five packets of mini cheddars into a fine powder, then mixing with water, cheese strings, baby bells, and finally pasta. The dish was served, but after his power nap the previous round, Alan was ravenously hungry, and before he could present it to Schmablo, he ate the whole thing for himself. Upstairs, Schmeg was once again waterboarding himself in the bath, so Deborah decided to seize the opportunity to make her next dish, a garden salad. Vegetables famously need a lot of chopping, something Deborah and her butter fingers really struggled with, and before she could finish her dish, she'd taken so much damage that a few of her appendages had fallen into the mixing bowl. This was nothing, however, compared to what would happen next, the reappearance of Bella Goth. For those who are unaware of Schmablo Picasso's history, Bella Goff is Schmablo's ex-girlfriend. She is an art thief who stole all of his paintings and forced him into a job in the music industry. Schmablo's head was boiling like a pot of potatoes. To think she had the gall to turn up here. Bella may have stolen his paintings, but she wasn't going to steal his food. Schmablo ripped into Bella with a string of clever insults, implying that her mother was a llama. He then rubbed his socks against the floor and electrocuted her over and over again, forcing her to leave the frying house. Finally, she was gone. You would have thought this victory would put Schmablo in a pretty good mood, but after eating Deborah's body part garden salad, he was once again feeling glum. Just like before, it fell to Schmeg Wallace to save Schmablo's brunch time. Schmeg would be cooking a party-sized serving of pan-fried tilapia. He patrolled his cooking station with mastery, but although his execution was flawless, he hadn't accounted for one major problem. Schmablo hates fish. Not only does he think it tastes disgusting, but by precedent, he doesn't eat things from the sea, as it's too deep and unexplored and it scares him. As such, after eating Schmeg's dish, Schmablo is in a state of shell shock. The round was given to Alan for his macaroni mini cheddars, and he was over the moon. Now though, it was time for a round that nobody had seen coming. The Elevenzers round to be performed as a specialised barbecue dish. Our contestants would have a choice between this nice modern grill and this Stone Age standard tribal clay oven. It was Schmeg's go first, and he chose the more contemporary option, as he set about making some burgers. I'm pretty sure he managed to get some sort of smoke poisoning in the process, but it's probably fine. After finishing his burgers, he for some reason presented them on the ground, but Schmablo was very happy with their outcome, showing his appreciation by grinning from ear to ear. Now it was Alan's turn, and being a man of tradition, he decided to cook using the clay pot. Alan would be making grilled chicken with corn on the cob, and Schmablo was also pleasantly surprised about just how good it tasted. Deborah then took to the stage, intending to make some grilled plantains. However, judging by her approach, it seems she was desperate for the toilet, and she had to stop her cooking partway through to relieve herself. While she was away from her cooking station, Alan swooped in with a bin bag and disposed of her meal. 
Alan was on such a rush after his strong recent performance that when it came to the lunch round, he decided to go first. It was at this point he would make a major error. Fish tacos. As previously established, Schmablo hates fish, and on top of this, Alan's preparation of the dish was not going well. Regardless, Alan was proud of the outcome, but upon tasting it, Schmablo felt instant regret. Hopefully, Deborah could conjure up something a bit better, and although she was very bored of cooking by this stage, she did manage to produce a respectable panda muertos, and Schmablo was much more satisfied. It seemed that Schmeg would have to pull off a miracle if he were to win this round, so he began to prepare his ultimate trump card a party-sized portion of fish and chips. He prepared the fish perfectly, aside from a couple of questionable trick shots, and even though his pot seemed to be filled with soup, he was somehow able to turn this mixture into fish and chips. This was the best meal yet. So good in fact that the other contestants couldn't resist having a taste. So good in fact that Schmablo Picasso forgot that fish and chips includes fish. Schmeg Wallace had scooped in for the win, and his momentum carried over into the dinner round, where he began to make a chili con carne. More flourishes and trick shots followed, and in the end, the smell of the meal alone was enough to satisfy Schmablo. Deborah needed to step up her game, and she did so by going back to her roots and making some biscuits. You see, in Germany, they eat biscuits all day. Nothing but Leibkuchen, gingerbread and biscuits, and the odd sausage and some Black Forest Gateau. But the point is, this was Deborah's forte. In the blink of an eye, the biscuits were done. But Deborah's German urges took over her body, and she ate them all before Schmablo even got a look in. Meanwhile, upstairs, Alan had to be woken up so he could take his turn. Unfortunately, this second power nap had messed with his memory a bit, and he accidentally started working on a second helping of fish tacos. As you can imagine, Schmablo was not best impressed. The round went to Schmeg once again, and we were now embarking on the final round. The confectionery round. Each contestant had to bake a cake, and Schmeg was up first, choosing to go for a blue confetti cake. This time, his cooking techniques were even more audacious, as he juggled bottles around in the air. When his cake came out the oven, it looked picture perfect, and in Schmablo's opinion, it tasted picture perfect as well. Alan, being a man of tradition, chose to make a classic chocolate cake. In the words of Lazy Town, you've got to do the cooking by the book, and Alan made sure he was very methodical. This produced predictable results. His cake was probably the most boring cake ever made. And speaking of boredom, Deborah was not having a good time. She had chosen to make a winter cake, and attempting to catch up with Schmeg, she also tried a couple of tricks. However, being the butterfingers that she is, she instead ended up breaking a bottle into her cake mixture, then cooking it in the oven filled with glass. Schmablo found this one particularly hard to digest. But with that, the competition was over, and it was time to vote for a winner. All three contestants gathered around, and Schmablo stood in front of them, contemplating his decision. Who should he vote for? Schmeg, who would outperform the other two in most disciplines, displaying a range of culinary talents, Alan, who did things the old-fashioned way but had an obsession with fish tacos, or Deborah, who'd almost killed him again by making him eat a cake full of glass. It was a really tough choice. They'd all been on such a journey together, and as he pondered, each contestant reminisced on their time in the frying house. A decision was made. The room became tense. Who would it be? All of a sudden, Schmablo began to walk away. Everyone was confused, but as he reached the fridge, something magical started to happen. Schmablo began to cook his famous French toast. He commanded his frying pan with the utmost grace, pulling out his signature move, the spatula pickaxe, over and over again. He wasn't stopping, and soon a crowd of people began to gather to watch his genius at work. Schmablo was unstoppable. He produced French toast after French toast, and suddenly, it was apparent what was happening. All at once, Schmeg, Alan, and Deborah began to cook in unison, attempting to combine their powers. But Schmablo was too good. The results were now set in stone. The winner of the Frying House Cooking Competition and head chef of my new restaurant, ladies and gentlemen, the ghost of Schmablo Picasso.